Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today, we're kicking off a new adventure, an old fox's new trick. All credit for this story goes to the talented author, whose details you can find in the description below. If you want to follow along, there's a link provided. We'll be covering chapters 1 through 4 in this session. And hey, don't forget to show some love by hitting that like button and dropping a comment. Your engagement really helps with the algorithm, and it means a lot to us. Alright, let's dive right into the story. Lost in the solace of thought, he couldn't help but wonder how the dream he had chased for the entirety of his life could leave him feeling so empty when it was fulfilled. How is it possible that all of my work, effort, blood, sweat, and tears could leave me so alone? Naruto thought to himself. He leaned back against the tree he was seated against and sighed with such weighty melancholy that anyone within earshot would have been reduced to a frown. Well, save one. Ah, Kurama scoffed at him. You thought that you could become a sage of six paths, be one of the two forces that ended the fourth shinobi war, defeat the one who fought all five kages to submission, defeat the progenitor of ninja, and then become the jinchuriki of all nine-tailed beasts without estranging yourself? I figured after everything we've been through you'd have a little bit more going on between those ears. Kurama chortled from his position on Naruto's lap. He proceeded to yawn and then curl into a ball and rested his head on his own singular bushy tail. That isn't even fair. Naruto pouted his lower lip out and harumphed while looking to side. And I'm not the, the Jinchuriki of the rest of them. They just come by to visit, sometimes. Kurama opened one red eye and shot Naruto a glare. Shikako has visited you through his chakra five times in the past week. You managed to tame the madness and then proceed to befriend even that stupid sand raccoon. I didn't even know Shikaku could be calmed down. Kurama's eye closed again as he stretched before returning to his position. Come on, he just has spent so much time alone after Hagoromo Gigi passed that he lost himself. I couldn't just leave him like that. I figured if I could get through to you then she would be a piece of cake. Naruto grinned. It lasted only a moment before the mirth quickly receded and left him feeling as empty as before. Bastard. I'm not saying I disagree with what you did, but the Kages know that if you called on any of us then we would be there with you in battle or otherwise. You are the only one since Hagoromo that has the respect of the tailed beasts. They aren't wrong to fear that. Naruto grunted in affirmation. A second later, a small smile played across his lips and he flicked Kurama's ear. The fox growled at Naruto, not even bothering to open his eyes. Are you saying that you respect me, Kurama? I think I might blush. Not even if you lived a hundred more years. Eight out of nine isn't bad, though. Naruto returned Kurama's growl and the fox snickered back while his body lightly shook from the action. You know if you choose to fight this, then they can't make you. Even Sasuke wouldn't be able to do anything about it nowadays. You don't have to do this, kid. Try as he might, the fact was that over the past 50 years Kurama had gotten close to him. It hurt to see his host put himself through this. I made my choice before this began. I chose to chase a power that would make me the best and let me protect everyone. I got my wish, and we were able to defeat Kagaya and seal her away. Just like you said, my fault I didn't realize how the next generation would react to that. Naruto gave such a weak smile. When Kurama popped his eyes open and saw the smile so devoid of anything resembling happiness, he couldn't help but slowly become enraged. As his chakra seeped out a mass exodus of birds and other creatures could be heard. Naruto once again flicked his ear causing Kurama to try to bite the offending finger. Naruto chuckled and pulled his hand back. A moment passed, and he then ran his hand through Kurama's fur. The pair sat in near silence as time passed. The only sound the wind through the trees as all of the wildlife had fled. Naruto. An old gruff voice called out. It's time. Naruto looked up and saw Sasuke standing there. Gray hair slightly above his shoulder and light wrinkles running through his face. Naruto heaved one last sigh and stood up. His young 17-year-old appearance a stark contrast to his aged best friend. How are they leaning? Naruto coughed, using his voice for the first time in weeks. Not good, Dobe. You know I'm not going to make you do this. I'm debating refusing regardless of the decision they make. Regardless of the decision you make. Kakashi won't let them do this if you refuse. Sasuke looked down at his best friend with a face filled with utter morose. Fifty years ago Naruto would be shocked to see such a sad expression on Sasuke's face, but his friend's face mirrored his own thoughts so perfectly that he couldn't even find it in himself to tease him. We've resolved ourselves to this path Sasuke, this isn't our world alone. If I'm creating problems then maybe it is time to set off on another journey. Naruto stood, displacing Kurama who floated to the ground and put a hand on his friend's shoulder. He gave him another weak smile and proceeded to walk ahead. Sasuke turned and followed side by side, while Kurama trailed behind both. They wouldn't even have a world if it weren't for us. I can't believe it has gotten to this point. Sasuke grunted, mentally running through possible solutions for the umpteenth time, as he tried to figure a way out of this that didn't involve a massacre. Something he could convince his friend and everyone else with to not take things towards what was becoming more apparent to be the inevitable end. Kids can't be expected to remember things they didn't live through Sasuke. 
We can tell them the stories, but they didn't live through the things we did. We fought and watched people die since we were twelve. Some of the new Kages haven't even seen death, Naruto explained softly. Sasuke once again grunted. There were no words to describe his feelings about what he knew he was going to be asked to do. You have to do it if they decide Sasuke. I won't bother this world any longer if it has no need of me. Sasuke wheeled on Naruto and grabbed him roughly by the shoulders. What if I need you, Dobe? Your friends are still here. All of us are here and doing everything we can to fight this. Why are you giving in? Sasuke broke down into tears and Naruto embraced him into his shoulder. An old man crying into a seeming boy's shoulders. Naruto's eyes were listless and empty as he remembered the past few years. After the Fourth Shinobi War, everything seemed like it was going to be fine. Naruto had settled down and was worshipped as a hero. Instead of every day being filled with battle, he was able to relax and spend time with the friends he never thought he would have. The tailed beasts were given freedoms they never expected as well. Each was allowed respective land to roam free unmolested. All except Kurama and Gyuki did so. Kurama was content to stay with Naruto and make sure their meeting place stayed in one piece, as he put it. A flimsy excuse all the bijou recognized, but left well enough alone. Gyuki likewise chose to stay with B until his passing, where he then too left to his allocated land. Regardless, after his time spent studying Fuenjutsu for a Naruto, was able to bind their chakra together, but free Kurama's body from himself like the other bijou. At first Naruto was tasked with a job from Tsunade Bachan to go around the world and stop crime. He stopped drug trading rings, human trafficking, dethroned mob bosses, and countless other things. When the maelstrom known as Naruto came through a distinct lack of crime followed. Over the next few years crime almost disappeared. What was the point if any aspiring criminal knew they would get caught? After he stamped out crime in the leaf the other nations would occasionally request help with more serious problems as well. All was well and good for decades. The only problem being the distinct lack of social life and grounding that Naruto had. Bouncing from place to place while being repeatedly assigned jobs. This had an unforeseen consequence that Naruto had never predicted. As he continued to stop crime in all ways, shapes, and forms the ninja from villages were growing weaker and weaker. Gone were the days of risking your village's children in life or death fights. A new age of peace was ushered in and Naruto was its enforcer. After Naruto's generation of Kages, retired a new generation took their place. Konoamaru was now the oldest of the Kage, the rest were in between 20 to 30. Konoamaru was also the last remaining ninja Hokage. The change surprised Naruto at first. All of the Kage had been ninja previously. He shrugged it off and convinced himself that it was just part of the changing times. Since the past four decades of peace, it seemed that the need for ninja was dying off. Although the ninja way was still alive and well in Kanahagakur, largely due to the preaching of Konomaru on the Will of Fire, even there the ninja were weaker than in his generation. His problems had started when the new rakage was dealing with protests in his streets. The people were protesting against the harsh yoke of taxation that the new rakage had imposed upon them. Something happened, and the protest got violent. The rakage then charged Naruto with discovering who was involved with the protest and rounding them up to be tried. Naruto then went into the Cloud Village and started to do just that. After some brief investigation that would have done Jiraiya proud, he was able to find the home of one of the protesters. Naruto did what was expected and informed the man that he was going to be taken before the Cloud's Council. What was not expected was what happened next. The man spun a story about how the protest was peaceful until they were attacked by the ninja police force of the Cloud. People were killed, blood filled the streets, and the protesters largely ran. There was violence to be had, but they were not the ones to initiate it. Naruto didn't know how to react. Sure, there were bad seeds in the leaf like Danzo, but no Kage had ever gone so far as to exterminate their people publicly in the streets. The Uchiha massacre was the worst thing a nation had ever done to their own people to his knowledge, and even that was carried out in the most cloak and dagger fashion possible. Naruto tracked more and more people down and the story stayed consistent. After hearing the same story for around the 30th time he had heard enough, he stormed to the rakage's office and demanded to know why an attack on innocent civilians was ordered. He demanded to know the reasoning behind the needless bloodshed. To this day, he could still remember the answer he received as vividly as the day he heard it. They weren't innocent people. We asked them to desist and they refused. This was against our law. We had jailed several in the previous protests many times before, and yet they continued. An example needed to be made, and we did it. You're here to uphold the law, not question it. Naruto sighed in real life, his arms patting Sasuke's shoulder as he continued to cry into his shoulder. It twisted a knife in his heart to see his best friend like this, but he had already made his decision. He was someone who protected his precious people, and they had been protected. Now it was time for him to fade away. We've had a good, full life Sasuke. I mean come on, I gotta see you have a daughter of all people. Even more impressive is the fact that she didn't turn out broody and reclusive. Naruto teased his old friend and punched him lightly in the shoulder while releasing him. 
Sasuke gave a watery chuckle and wiped his arm into his elbow. Heh, stupid doe, Sasuke muttered. Naruto chose not to tease his friend on the redundancy and started to press forward towards a large building a few miles away where the Five Kage Summit was being held. It was time to face his destiny. This Five Kage Summit has come to a conclusion concerning Uzumaki Naruto and his crimes against humanity. The charges brought forth were destabilizing the world economy, threatening four of the five nations with force or usurpation, refusing to comply with national policy and assault of the rakage. In all of the aforementioned matters we find him guilty and sentenced to exile said the Mizukage, a young male with blue hair. There was silence following his words that lasted for less than a second. This is absurd. Kanoamaru roared at the assembly. A wizened man in a sea of young rulers. This man is the only reason you have a nation. The only reason any of you were even able to be born. Your predecessors would never have allowed for this madness. He continued to bellow over the gathered assembly of seven. Naruto and Sasuke standing below their elevate seats at a semicircular table. That in itself is part of the problem. The Kazakage coolly replied. A young woman with red hair running down her lower back. Naruto had reflected in the past that she looked similar to the fifth Mizukage, except without a shred of her warmth. The previous Kazakage threatened to usurp my authority and retake his position should I allow this to pass. Your generation is filled with powerful warriors willing to fly off the handle to dispense their own justice. Uzumaki is the pinnacle of this philosophy. Time and time again have we as nations made decisions only to have them vetoed by the threat of overwhelming force. You made decisions that cost lives, restricted the rights of your people, and slandered what it means to be Kage. Your decisions, as you call them, were mad. Kanoamaru continued to shout. His old voice flamed with the intensity of steel being ground against gravel. No matter how many times Naruto saw Kanoamaru with his gray goatee and elderly face, he could never stop thinking of him as the scarf-wearing boy he taught Jutsu to. Our decisions are ours to make. I suppose I should say our decisions should be ours to make as they clearly have not been. She levied Naruto an icy glare. Exemplifying this is his actions after the revolt against the rakage. He demanded that the decision to try the criminals be overturned. Then when it was decided by popular vote that they should be persecuted, he demanded that decision be overturned. He then set up his own village for the criminals and land, ceded to him by the Hokage southwest of Shimogo, when justice was demanded, and ferried them away from any consequence to their action. Throughout multiple other incidents across the nations, he continued to funnel criminals and their families into his village, after which he gave them such abundance by channeling his chakra into one of the last known users of of Mokutan to create a rich landscape filled with life and abundance. The Kazakage took a deep breath and then pressed forward. He then proceeded to train that village in the ways of the ninja so they could protect themselves. When questioned about the training of a dangerous group of criminals, Uzumaki stipulated that it was purely as a defensive measure and they would not use it aggressively. However, multiple incidents have been cited in which exactly that was done. Usually it was in response to some slight against the name of their god. The people of that village view him as their deity for Kami's sake. When the intent to persecute Uzumaki for his many crimes was made known they threatened war on any nation that voted in favor. The Kazakage worked herself up through her speech to the point where it ended with her shouting. I don't even know where to start with you, Sasuke said in a low, quiet voice that still managed to pierce through everyone in the room like a sandbon. First, in the case of the Rakage Revolt, a vote was only allowed to take place after a week of intense propaganda, which spread the idea that the violence was initiated by the protesters. The Rakage stood and was about to speak when Sasuke pressed on to cut him off. Even though the Rakage and his office never gave an official statement on what exactly happened, the rumor was allowed to circulate before any vote was taken, and he made no attempt to correct the misconception. You all know what the Rakage did. You all know it was intentional, and none of you care. When you tasked Naruto with being a protector, you should have known that he would protect the people in any situation. That includes the rakage revolt where he had to protect them from you. Sasuke finished coldly, glaring down the rakage with a hatred bordering bloodlust. The rakage quailed before the sheer intensity of his gaze. We could argue about this for another week. We have argued about this for the better part of a year. The arguments have stayed the same for the entire time, and no opinion has changed the slightest iota. If we proceed any longer Hataki Kakashi may pass, and this decision will ultimately be moot. Regardless of your stance Sasuke, the Five Kage Summit has reached their decision. Naruto Uzumaki, what will you do? The Tsuchikage asked. Naruto smiled weakly at the Tsuchikage, knowing that this man was one of the two votes in his favor when the die was cast. He was the son of the fourth Tsuchikage, and had been brought up hearing tales of Naruto's heroism from his mother. When Naruto had brought grievances to his nation he responded diplomatically, either convincing Naruto to his side or being convinced to Naruto's. Their relationship was that of distant friends, and it pained him to see that this was how things had ended. I will go. Naruto responded simply. Those three short words had the impact of a death knell to his friend standing beside him. 
Kanoamaru's world shattered in front of him, the teacher he had always aspired to make proud, who had trained him and taught him what it meant to be a ninja. I couldn't save him. Kanoamaru mourned internally. He slumped back into the chair as all intensity left his body. He appeared a lifeless marionette whose strings has been cut. The sheer devastation that the situation wrought on his emotions was catastrophic. A shame deeper than any ravine. A hopelessness and emptiness so expansive it encompassed him in its entirety. Whereas the Tsuchikage also appeared saddened the other three Kages could have defined smug. They had finally got what they had been working towards the past half-decade. In the event that this was approved and agreed to by Naruto, there are a list of demands set by Hataki Kakashi for him to be willing to proceed. Sasuke stated at a pace so slow it seemed like each word caused him physical harm. The faces of the three Kages lost their smugness and turned into various aggressive frowns. He pressed on despite their looks that said they very clearly did not wish him to do so. Firstly, let it be known that the village Naruto founded, the village hidden in the maelstrom will not be aggressed upon by any of the Kage under any circumstance. If any individuals from the village act out after the verdict, they will be dealt with on an individual basis. All of the Kages will agree that an action by an individual cannot constitute an act of retaliation on the village itself. The three Kage leaned in and whispered to each other while Kanoamaru gave a smile towards Sasuke. Internally, he thanked Kakashi for at least helping to protect the legacy of his teacher. We reluctantly agree to this. The Mizukage responded. Sasuke nodded and then continued. Secondly, all of the Bijou who wish to leave with Naruto will be allowed to. This stipulation had the rakage standing up again ready to interject. Sasuke proceeded to again ignore this. This stipulation is put in place because the main argument to your banishment is that Naruto is too powerful to be controlled. The bijou have always upset the balance of power in history when sought to be used as weapons or even as deterrents and go exactly against the philosophy you use to justify his exile. That aside, under the influence of Naruto, even the most violent of the bijou have been calmed. Inciting their wrath would lead to wanton destruction. Not to mention jailing them to a container which they would not consent would be impossible, Sasuke concluded logically. Finally, the rakage would take no more. The Uchiha have the ability to subjugate the tailed beasts. Although not as proficient as Uzumaki himself, we also have some few who know the old ways of Fuenjutsu. We would absolutely be able to contain the bijou and have every right to use them to prevent war as in the days of old. The rakage raged towards a resolute Sasuke. He was about to continue when he felt a hate so palpable that it robbed him of his ability to speak. A rage so intense he felt like he was drowning in a pool of tar so thick that he couldn't hope to move. All of the Kage but Kanoamaru started gasping for breath, as if they were suffocating, and even he was wincing as if in pain. You dare think to enslave us again? A voice rumbled from outside the room. The double doors burst open and Kurama slowly stomped into the room. Although he was much larger than he previously was he still only stood six feet tall, but now in possession of all of his tails. Each step he took intensifying the miasma of hate that was enveloping them all. Naruto looked back and was about to placate Kurama when a blast of his chakra, so intense caused the rakage to faint. The remaining Mizukage and Kazakage now received the bulk of his ire. I will give you one chance to revise your stance on this. It appears that the rakage is indisposed, so I will presume you insects fit to speak on his behalf. The council will accept the terms for all willing bijou to leave along with Uzumaki. The previously proud Kazakage practically squeaked out her voice brittle and weak under a power that so greatly and unfathomably surpassed her own. The malice started to recede as he gave them a withering glare. T Karama growled and turned back out through the door. Sasuke looked smug and would probably chuckle in any other situation. Neither I nor my daughter Sarada would be willing to subjugate the bijou and hopefully that demonstration shows that even if you have not morally reconsidered your stance you would not have the power to. So although you may consider the decision made under duress, I can assure you it is the right one. Sasuke stated with a little more joy than was professional to show. Indeed, the Kazakage concluded. The final demand is simple. Hataki Kakashi's eyes will be preserved and safeguarded by the Uchiha clan. If the council ever deems fit to reverse their decision then a descendant of my lineage may venture forth and seek to invite him back to this dimension if an only if is willing. Sasuke concluded. That is easily the most agreeable of the terms. If it is the will of the council that Uzumaki return then we will let him. The Mizukage agreed. Sasuke was slightly amused that they seemed aware that the Tsuchikage and Hokage would agree to anything in Naruto's favor, so they only needed one of them to defect to change the vote on any decision. Then we will set off to where the bijou are gathered to offer them their chance to leave. I have no desire to be in a room with you bastards any longer than possible. Were it not for the fact that I needed to stay behind to guarantee you kept your promises, I would not want to be in the same dimension as you either. Sasuke barked at them. He quickly turned and left putting a hand on the seemingly shell-shocked Naruto's shoulder and guiding him out the doors. He continued to lead him out the winding corridors to the exit, all the while keeping a guiding hand on him. 
Kurama followed closely behind in utter silence. Throughout all his years he had never seen his friend look so fragile, so broken, so betrayed. Every fiber of his being was telling him to go back and threaten the council into submission. Only the knowledge that Naruto would actively fight him if he did held him back. You know, even though we knew it was hopeless I thought just maybe I'd done enough. Maybe they'd realize that all I ever wanted was to help people and make sure that everyone had a chance to live a good and honest life. I thought that maybe, just maybe they'd realize what they were doing wrong and repent, so we could come to some kind of agreement to help all the people who had been wronged. I guess even at 67 I'm still a kid. Naruto slowly let out all of his emotion. Everything he had worked for held against him. All of the energy he had invested drained out of him. The utter emptiness threatened to consume him until Sasuke grabbed him by the shoulders and turned him to face his old friend. Don't you worry, Doe. He almost sobbed, the beginning of tears forming in his eyes. I found a place where you can finally live a good life. You can relax, chase dreams, or do whatever you want. I did everything I could to find a place where you could be happy. Just promise me you'll try to be happy. Sasuke once again broke down on his friend's shoulder. Naruto once again embraced his friend as his own eyes started to water. I promise. He replied quietly. He wondered if he could turn back time if he would make different choices, but even now he stood by every decision that he had made however disastrous the end. He heard the sound of footsteps and looked to his side to see Kanoamaru walking out of the building. Nikken? Kanoamaru softly questioned. An unspoken question that Naruto heard without it needing to be said. I'll be alright Kanoamaru. It is just the start of a new adventure. I'll go give this new place hell. Naruto joked to attempt to lighten the mood of his student and longtime friend. He knew that Kanoamaru had tried his best to stop this. He had offered trade concessions, land, favors, and everything in between to try and win one of the three votes to his side. It just hadn't been enough. I'm going to find you a way back home, Nikon. When I do, you come back to me all right? The elderly Kanoamaru demanded. Even now it felt like he was the crying kid he remembered all those years ago. Naruto smiled a warm and loving smile at his dear friend. You don't waste your whole life trying to find me a way back you here? Just know that if you guys ever need me I'll be there for you. I'll do my best to make sure Kurama and Shu don't break anything wherever they are sending me. Naruto continued to try and lighten Kanoamaru's inconsolable mood. Yet with that seemingly innocuous joke Kanoamaru let out a chuckle. Between trying to keep those two behaved and trying to convince those morons to change their mind I can't quite say which of us has the harder job. He joked back. Kurama let out a low and unserious growl. This kid being able to make me do anything? Ah, here I was thinking that your humor would be as bad as the thirds. Kurama fired back. Finally the group shared in a moment of laughter, and the tension began to lift. Naruto basked in the warmth of their friendship, and tried to avoid the fear of what his life would be once he lost it. After a while of basking in the much-needed afterglow of a happy moment Sasuke, turned to Naruto. It is time to go Naruto. He said softly. Words so soft because of some primal notion that if they were quiet enough, they would somehow be able to avoid breaking this moment. Ok, Naruto replied. Naruto strolled through the streets of Vale with a confident gait to his step. For the first time in a long time, he was excited to actually do something. He scratched his head guiltily realizing that as far as his promise to make sure he found happiness, he wasn't exactly doing the best job so far. That stops today though. I'm going to ace this test, get into school and finally be cool. Naruto beamed internally. I felt sorry for you when you were forced to leave the elemental nations. I thought the sorrow might actually break you. Yet here we are one year later, and your grand plan is something as banal as going to school. If I could go back in time, and take back ever feeling the slightest bit of pity for you I would. Kurama groaned mentally at Naruto as he plodded alongside him down the road. Naruto stuck his tongue out at his companion. I'm so sorry I thought I'd actually do something I found fun. You're right. We should have continued meditating in the forest and gathering information for another year. That was a hoot and a half for the first one, right? Or maybe you were hoping we'd take over the world and see if anyone could stop us. Naruto snarked at his companion. Naruto, you have the best ideas. Let's do that. I haven't killed anyone in ages. If we declared ourselves supreme rulers, then surely someone interesting to kill would come along. Shikaku giggled maniacally inside Naruto's head. The shinobi gave an exasperated sigh having become all too used to dealing with Shikaku after having him sealed inside for the past year. Shu, I thought we got over your need to kill people. We've been working on it for 40-odd years now. Naruto berated the raccoon. Shikaku did nothing but giggle more. I've gotten over it nair and nair. Just because I don't feel the need to kill people doesn't mean I don't enjoy it though. You never said I had to stop doing that. Kit, very considered. Give me back bloodthirsty, mad, and mentally unstable Shikaku. This docile house bet makes me want to wretch. Kurama jokingly begged. At least Naruto hoped he was joking. Bizarre as Shu's nickname for him, was he quite preferred it to him convincing him to kill people on a day-to-day -day basis like what happened with Gara. Lighten up Kurama. This is the first human since Tusan that Shikako, 
has actually managed to get along with. If we want to be optimistic and look at this as a fresh start for Naruto Boy, then it is almost like a fresh start for him as well. Gyuki chastised Kurama. Though the Eight and Nine Tails had long since gotten past their dislike of each other, it didn't stop them from bickering like eight-year-old brothers. Yeah, yeah, whatever you say, Eight. Just know if you start calling the kid anything that's stupid, I will personally turn you into calamari. I would like to see you try. I wouldn't even need to try you, Eight-Tailed Giant Cephalopod. Tusan gave you one more tail, one. And over the millennia, you still haven't shut up about it. Killing each other could be fun, too. Shikaku interjected gleefully. Naruto once again gave an exasperated sigh at the antics of the three bijou who chose to come with him. Blocking them out mentally, he continued down the street with Kurama, following along with him. When he left the Elemental Nations a year ago, these three decided to come with him. He wasn't particularly surprised that Gyuki had chosen to tag along considering how close they had gotten over the years through B. But the fact that Shikaku agreed to be resealed to a host was completely out of left field. The remaining six bijou decided to stay behind, and had all agreed to lump a little closer together to avoid being taken advantage of again. After the experience with Madara, they were hesitant to spread out again without Naruto around. They didn't think there were any people left that could pose a threat to them, but a little paranoia never hurt. Naruto continued wandering towards a bullhead station, as he remarked how out of place he looked. Maybe I should have gotten some different clothes. He thought to himself with a hint of embarrassment. He was wearing his sage cloak, which continued to lightly billow in the wind as he walked. He had to return the toad scroll to Ma and Pa when he left the elemental nations, but they wanted him to keep his cloak to remember them by. Under threat of having it shredded by Kurama's claws Naruto, was reluctantly forced out of his usual training jumper and into some orange sweatpants with a black shirt that had the Uzumaki symbol in orange on the front. Even then his fox companion still complained there was too much orange. He is almost entirely orange. Naruto growled to himself. And I look good. You look like an idiot. Kurama insulted the blonde shinobi. Naruto almost kicked the walking fox, but he nimbly jumped out of his range. That was probably for the best considering he couldn't imagine a scenario where he started fighting with Kurama in the streets and things went well. After one last sign Naruto reached the bullhead station and managed to find one that was departing for Beacon. You heading to Beacon, kid? The pilot inquired without even glancing in his direction. Yeah, meeting a professor there. Naruto responded briefly, loading into the bullhead before even being given permission. Hang tight then, we're wheels up in five. The pilot responded. Naruto pondered the phrase considering he was fairly certain bullheads didn't have wheels. After a short wait and no one other than him boarding the bullhead, they made their way to Beacon where he got let off. When he got to the ground, he felt a little worse for wear. Kimmy, that feels weird. I never felt like that flying on size birds. Naruto complained internally. Less bitching more walking kid. If you're hellbent on going to school again, then I'm not going to let you be a dunce like last time. We're showing up to this meeting on time. I'm not dealing with another lifetime of teachers thinking you're an idiot. Kurama commanded his host, pulling his pant leg with his mouth until Naruto started moving on his own. Come on Kurama, I think I have enough life experience at this point to handle a simple school for kids. Naruto laughed to himself. This would be a piece of cake. You are three minutes late to your interview Mr. Uzumaki. Is this the care that we can expect you to show to your tasks should you enter this school? Is being on time to an interview above and beyond the professionalism we can expect from you? A blonde teacher asked him with a curt voice and a tongue of barbed wire. Naruto physically flinched at her reprimand while trying to drown out Kurama's uproarious laughter. It'll be easy, the kid says. I've got life experience, he says. I like this one kid. You should try to get on her good side. She might be good for your first romp in the... Mr. Uzumaki, are you paying attention? The teacher lashed out at him verbally. Kurama snickered verbally from his position wrapped around his shoulder in his one-tailed form. The teacher's eyes narrowed at the fox that for some reason seemed to be enjoying this. Yes, professor. Absolutely 100% entirely focused and concentrated on what you are saying. Naruto replied quickly, not wanting to provoke any more ire from this hellcat of a woman. She was holding what he had only recently learned was called a riding crop in her hand, and constantly gestured with it like she was two seconds away from mauling him with it. The sight didn't imbue him with an overly large sense of confidence in his situation. Good. You'll be meeting with Professor Ashbin to conduct your interview right away. The interview is largely done on his own terms, but you can expect to have to submit to an aura test, a semblance review, and a possible spar between a student of the school. The professor lectured to him while continuing to walk at a brusque pace. They eventually reached an elevator where she keyed something into a keypad before it opened. Kami, this technology still surprises me. I know we had made advances back in the elemental nations before I left, but I guess I just never really got to see much of them. Even then I don't think they were like this. Naruto thought to himself. He then looked to the teacher and steeled his resolve. I'm sorry, professor, but I feel like we've gotten off to a bad start. I just wanted to apologize and say I'm absolutely going to take this seriously, Databeo. Naruto grinned at the teacher. Kill me. I thought I got rid of that years ago. 
Naruto internally bashed his head against a wall after hearing that childish phrase of his comeback. He could hear all three bijou laughing at him. Despite his inner embarrassment, the teacher seemed to well it wasn't a smile by any means, but he supposed her lips appeared to be in a less tight frown. Hey, that's gotta count for something. Just make sure you take this seriously. It is very unusual for the headmaster to conduct an interview on someone with such a lack of qualifications. I hope you're sure you are ready for the rigors of this school. When the professor replied with her harsh voice, it sounded slightly less harsh. At least Naruto thought that it did. He couldn't exactly discount wishful thinking at this point though. After what felt like a lengthy travel upwards, he finally followed the professor as she disembarked into a large office. One desk was at the right, and he assumed that was where he would find this Professor Ashbin. However, upon squinting his eyes, just to be sure he came to a realization. There is no one there. He remarked simply to himself. The professor that led him and lightly bent her riding crop between both her hands. Her teeth seemed to lightly grind together, and Naruto could feel her glare piercing through a man who was supposed to be at his desk and yet clearly wasn't. Professor Ashbin should be here shortly. Why don't you take a seat across from his desk and wait for him to arrive? I shall attempt to locate him for you. The woman seemingly seated as she opened the elevator door again and proceeded to head down. Naruto shrugged and decided that he might as well take a seat as suggested. About halfway across the office, he stopped suddenly as his eyes narrowed. Naruto boy, Yuki cautioned, quickly tapping into his sage mode, something he had learned to do in mere moments over his long periods of training as he wandered. He quickly noticed a presence behind a wall to his left. You know that lady is pretty scary. I wouldn't want to be you when she finds out you were in your office the entire time. Naruto called out as he looked in the direction of the person he detected. He quickly released his sage mode as his pupils returned to normal. Interesting that you would call a professor of a school you are applying to scary, but in this instance, I can't help but agree with you. The voice called out from behind the wall. The wall itself seemed to open outward like a door as it was pushed by a cane. From behind it came a bespectacled man in a green suit with messy gray hair. I don't get it. What do those glasses do? They are so tiny and so far down on his nose. Shikaka questioned. If he was in a physical form, you could imagine his head actually tilting to the side in confusion. Naruto chuckled at the observation and then proceeded to watch the professor as he walked around and took a seat at the desk. After a moment's pause, Naruto also chose to sit down at the chair provided for him. Kurama then jumped up and curled up on his lap and started to pretend to nap. So Mr. Uzumaki, what brings you to Beacon? It is not the most normal thing for a student without previous schooling or apprenticeship to decide they want to become a huntsman. What drove you to your decision? Ashbin asked him. Kid, watch it around this one. I don't like the way he feels. Kurama cautioned. I agree Naruto boy. This one has the eyes of a predator. Don't give him too much to go off of. Gyuki concurred. If anything seeing the two finally agree on something put Naruto more on edge than anything else. Well I grew up by myself without anyone to care for me. It was a pretty rough life and I just wanted to try and help everyone that I could. Sometimes people are down on their luck and just need a hero, you know? Naruto replied with a grin. Rather than try to lie he figured using the whole truth would make it easier to hide. If this old man didn't see any reason not to trust him then maybe he wouldn't push for any questions he would have to lie about. The professor smiled back at him giving Naruto a small measure of relief. So you mentioned in your letter for application. I'm glad to see that wish was genuine. Was there any other reason that you wished to attend? The professor probed again. Hey, to be honest I don't really have any friends. I thought this would be a nice way to get some. Naruto replied to which the professor raised an eyebrow. Naruto slightly panicked and quickly added, I'm totally serious about the helping people thing though. That is definitely motive number one. I just thought this might be a chance to not be alone. Something is off about this child. Ashbin thought to himself as he observed the spiky-haired blonde boy with a fox in his lap. He sounds less like a child confined to a solitary existence and more like one who has loved and lost. Perhaps he lost his friends to the grim? Maybe a victim of circumstance? Ashbin continued to spin ideas quickly around his head, but could come to no conclusions. He then decided to speed this along to save the child any unneeded stress from a prolonged interview. Most certainly not because he did not want to be caught in Glinda's rampage should she return before he finished. Seeking friendship is something we encourage here at Beacon. We believe a team will work better together and weather the physical and mental fatigue better with the support of friendship. I am nothing but glad to hear that you seek things as such. Ashbin allowed the child to smile. Since I find your motive to be satisfactory wheel, next move to the aura and semblance based part of the interview. Have you had your aura unlocked, Mr. Uzumaki? Yes, sir. Unlocked and versed in it. Naruto replied with a chipper attitude. Below him, the fox's ears flicked. Good, good. Now before we proceed to the aura test, could you describe your semblance to me? Possibly demonstrate it if it is not dangerous? Ashbin requested curiously. The child blinked twice and then started to talk. Yes, sure. So I have three guardian spirits of my home that allow me to channel their powers. Each of them allows me to use different abilities. 
This fox here is Kurama. He was the first spirit that I learned to cooperate with. Other than him, I work with Gyuki and Octopus Ox and Shikaku at Tanuki. Naruto added on. He then brought his hand to his stomach and two bizarre creatures appeared on the side of each shoulder, each a bit larger than a fist. Ashpin observed that the Tanuki appeared to be made of sand, whereas the, is that truly an octopus? Ashpin thought to himself as he slightly squinted at the pinkish thing on his right shoulder. It appears to be missing a horn. I wonder why. So if you can have them all of these guardians out at one time, why do you not? Ashpin questioned the boy. Well, to be honest, it is because Gyuki and Shikaku don't like being out too often. They find it exhausting. Kurama, on the other hand, basically demands it. He only returns to his realm when absolutely necessary. Naruto answered sheepishly while rubbing the back of his head. Ashpin arched an eyebrow at the boy inquisitively. Picking up on his intent, Naruto added. Sometimes when we need to get groceries or go into certain places, a large fox stalking about can cause some problems. The fox opened one eye to look at the boy and then appeared to scoff. Well, that is interesting. I wonder if these guardians are sentient. Well, I won't continue to bore you for details. Assuming a normal or above aura level, I believe you would be a fantastic addition to Beacon Academy. Ozip smiled at the child who grinned back happily. He truly felt like the boy's smile would be contagious at the school. Maybe he would even make Glinda smile. At least I can dream of such a world. Ashbin sighed to himself. Ashbin then stood up and opened a drawer to his, his desk and pulled out what looked like a simple glass and metal weight scale. He walked around his desk and set it down next to Naruto and proceeded to sit back down. Now what you need to do is stand on that scale and attempt to flare your aura out if you can. That should give us a measure of how much you have. Ashbin informed him. Naruto started to look nervous and gave a small chuckle. What exactly am I shooting for here? You know, so I can be at the top of my class and stuff. Naruto laughed in a manner that seemed forced. Ashbin observed the boy quizzically. Is he worried that his aura is too low? Is most of his aura stored in these guardians of his, and they merely grant it to him? His semblance is so bizarre I'm not sure if this will be an accurate measure of his prowess. An average student in their first year score between 100 to 200 on this scale. The upper level students would average in between 400 to 500. An average high level huntsman will hover around 2 thou dash. Ashbin was cut off as Naruto stepped on the scale. It sparked violently, and then the display dimmed out completely. Crap. Naruto swore mentally. Kurama smiled a toothy grin from his position on the chair Naruto had vacated previously and Shikaku was laughing hysterically from his shoulder. I really don't know what you expected standing on an energy measuring scale with two bijou on your shoulder kit. Kurama playfully chastised his partner. Naruto looked to Gyuki and Shikaku and facebombed. I forgot you two were there, Kreo. He swore again. Shikaka's unabated laughter seemingly renewed as Naruto twisted his seal causing both of the bijou to disappear from his shoulder. He then looked up to Ashbin who was eyeing him curiously. Come on, think of something to say Naruto. 67 years of experience. You got this. It seems that this scale was defective. Naruto declared authoritatively, his face seeming to be the picture of confidence. Below the surface, however, Air Agag, the best excuse I could come up with was, it must be broken. I really should have spent more of my time learning to lie, or at least talking with people. You'd think I was still a kid. Indeed. Ashbin stated simply, eyeing Naruto with almost unrestrained curiosity at this point. Perhaps we will try another then. Ashbin reached for another scale that appeared identical to the first one and passed it to Naruto. Naruto gingerly reached out for it and gently set it on the ground next to the first one. Naruto stared at it as if the scale was challenging him. Well, I never back down from a challenge. Restrain all of your chakra, you three. I'm going to try and lower my chakra flow as much as possible. Naruto started to deeply breathe in and slowly breathe out. After a few reps of this, he stood on the scale. He let out a cheer as the scale didn't basically explode this time. He was less enthused when a string of question marks appeared on the scale. That would mean the scale is unable to accurately measure your aura. Have you taken an aura measurement test before? Ashbin asked Naruto with eyes narrowed at him. Naruto was beginning to think he was drawing far too much of this professor's curiosity. Nope. Never done this before. Not a single time. What if we just give me a test run in the school, and if I don't perform well you can always just throw me out? Naruto suggested desperately. Ashbin once again arched the dreaded eyebrow and once again reached into a compartment in his desk. Let's try one more test before we get to that point. Here, let's try this. Ashbin pulled his arm out of his desk to reveal a scale, but unlike the last two this one appeared to be larger, heavier, and more sturdily built. Try once more with this one. Ashbin asked as he passed the scale to Naruto. Okay Naruto boy, we're going to try to actively contain your chakra this time. We'll try to get it as far down as possible, so we can pass this test normally. Gyuki informed Naruto. Naruto nodded physically and took a deep breath. With great anticipation he stepped onto the scale and nervously watched as a series of numbers flicked on the display like a slot machine. 
After a few moments Naruto almost leapt in joy when he saw that finally this scale had displayed a number. Good job you guys, we did it. Good job holding back. Naruto praised his jubi. Kurama laughed, and it sounded like air being pushed from his mouth. Shikaka started another giggling fit and Gyuki face palmed in Naruto's mental landscape. Check the number kid. Kurama suggested, still laughing. Naruto leaned down and squinted at the number. Huh that's weird. From here it looks like it is saying. 9001. Ashpin stated calmly as he looked at a handheld device that was clearly somehow attached to the scale's readings. Naruto's thoughts started to race at a thousand miles a minute. Oh Kami, he said the average score was 2000 for their fully trained. I just quadrupled that. Naruto internally panicked. Kurama and Shikaku both continued to laugh in their own way. Quadruple and a half nera nera. You think you could do math better at this point? Shikaku teased. I was trying to make myself feel even slightly better shoe. Thank you for ruining that. Naruto seethed at his Tanuki companion, who couldn't help but beam back at him. Searching desperately for an excuse Naruto, said the first thing that came to mind. I guess my semblance must affect the scale somehow. Naruto chimed in helpfully with a smile on his face. That has to work. From all the information I've gathered over the past year, I don't think anyone has a clue how semblances work. If I blame that then I should be home scot-free. That is completely possible. The professor stated simply. Naruto gave an internal sigh of relief. However, perhaps your fox guardian could attempt to stand on the scale. Ashbin asked what appeared to be a question, but his tone stated it as more of a command. That sounds like an absolutely terrible idea. Naruto replied altogether too quickly. And why is that? He is a being of pure energy and aura. If I did that to your scale, I really don't want to know what will happen if he gets on it. Naruto logically defended himself. Surely the professor didn't want to break his fancy scale. Humor me. Naruto's hopes and dreams crash landed on an island with no hope of rescue. He was about to rally another defense when Kurama lithely stepped down onto the scale for naught but two seconds. He then got off of it and curled back into a ball on the chair. One might have been confused why he left the scale so quickly when it took around 10 seconds to calibrate Naruto's own aura. Upon observation though the answer was quite simple. The scale was on fire. Naruto sighed the heaviest sigh he could remember sighing for the better part of his lifetime. Now laying on a bed inside a single dorm room, the headmaster had decided to let him reside in until the school term began tomorrow. He would have started trying to relax if being behind closed doors didn't lead to Kurama's laughter, escalating to a dull roar now that he no longer had to pretend to be a simple fox. Holy shit kid, that was the funniest thing that I've seen in the past century. I can't remember a time you've panicked so bad. Kurama teased jovially as he was still wrought with fits of laughter. Naruto scowled and threw a pillow at the fox who was curled up on the floor rug. He easily dodged out of the way but it felt cathartic anyway. I thought he was going to throw me out then and there. Instead he goes, welcome to Beacon Academy Mr. Uzumaki. Gives me a key card for this room and then sends me off. What the hell is this place? Naruto vented his frustrations freely, having already set up a few injutsu seal on the wall to soundproof his room. He also had checked for cameras and listening devices because he didn't put it past that old man to have a few. Thankfully his search had turned up empty, so he could try relax. He most certainly is an odd one. He felt incredibly intelligent and was very shrewd. I couldn't get a read on him myself. Gyuki grumbled grumpily. He didn't appreciate the fact that someone was able to so thoroughly conceal their intentions from him. He prided himself on his perceptiveness. Eight is right. Even with my ability to sense emotions, I didn't get anything off the man. He almost felt inhuman. Kurama added, equally miffed that he couldn't get anything off the professor. He looks really fun. We should ki I mean fight him. Shikaku added in joyfully. I would like to revisit the motion to revert Shikaku back to his previous self. Kurama grumbled. If I meet anyone else with his level of sunny disposition, I'm going to eat them. Let's just go to bed and wait until the remainder of the students arrive tomorrow. I'm friggin' done with this day. Besides the age to enlist at this academy is 17. I'm sure the students here are more well-rounded than the kids back at the academy. Naruto replied. He turned off the lights and hopped into bed. Kurama nestled up against him and they both quickly fell asleep. It was on the morrow that Naruto was going to be reminded how utterly wrong a person could possibly be. That is unnecessarily large. Kurama commented from his perch atop Naruto's shoulder. Naruto couldn't help but agree as the massive airship touched down. He was seated legs crossed atop the school's roof in sage mode. A few birds had flown down to attempt to greet him, but were immediately scared off by the lump of fur occupying their intended perch. Nero Nero, why are you scouting these little people? Do you think the tiny ones will help us conquer the world? Oh, you intend them to be our foot soldiers. But wait, couldn't you just make clones? I'm confused again. Shikaku continued to attempt to understand the machinations of his host in earnest, while the other three felt an intense wave of exasperation. Shu, we really have to work on your people's skills. You know you might have to actually talk to some of these people if I introduce you? You can't be telling them you want to kill them, 
or subjugate them, or any other number of insane things I can imagine you saying. Naruto scolded his Tanuki friend. Kurama gave a breathy laugh atop his shoulder. I've gotta hand it to you, kid. 67 years later, and you can still manage to surprise me. Naruto preened at the perceived praise from Kurama. How a human can live that long and still be so delusional is really a supreme work of effort. Maybe you should write a book detailing exactly how one can reach and maintain such levels of naivete. Naruto growled at his fox and punched him in the head. Kurama then lashed out and clawed his face. In a matter of moments, the two were wrestling back and forth on the rooftop in a mix of tooth, fist, and claw. Naruto boy, act your age and focus on what you came here to do. Kurama is a lost cause. Don't waste your breath. Gyuki scolded the shinobi. The fox and ninja comically stopped mid-grapple, grunted and then disengaged from each other to resume their previous position looking over the school grounds. Looking over the school grounds. All right, good. Now start searching for anyone who might be a good friend for Naruto boy. Kurama scoffed atop his Jinchuriki shoulder, but nonetheless narrowed his eyes at the airship, waiting for the passengers to begin disembarking. Not a moment later, a large hangar door opened and a ramp led down off the ship. Kurama flicked his tail disinterestedly as he continued to watch kid after kid walk out of the airship. He gave a bored yawn until he was rewarded with a sight that made him break out into a toothy grin. Blonde bombshell straight ahead. She looks like she'd be the perfect friend for our little kid. Kurama suggested deviously. Naruto leveled a glare at his partner. Any reason that you are suggesting this other than how she looks? Gaki, you wound me. Naruto's glare towards his fox partner did not recede until the fox broke into a small chuckle. Jokes aside, I sense something in her that feels familiar to me. Much lesser, of course, but familiar. Kurama's tail began to brush back and forth across Naruto's shoulders in vague interest. Naruto considered it high praise that Kurama would even begin to slightly equate an individual to himself. I like the one with Kushina's hair. Gyuki stated. Naruto focused on an armored woman with her hair drawn up into a ponytail. His pulse quickened slightly, which really should have been imperceptible to anyone. Looks like the kid likes her too. Kurama teased while prodding Naruto's cheek with his sinuous tail. A light blush took over his face as he avoided Kurama's gaze at all costs. Kurama continued to laugh at his expense while Gyuki regarded Naruto with a fondness an uncle would for his favorite nephew. I like that one. She looks fun. Do you think her blood is tasty? Shikaku mentally directed Naruto's gaze to one orange-haired girl in a skirt. Naruto almost panicked as he thought he saw her use her ration to instantly move from side to side of a certain boy dressed in green. He sighed in relief when he realized she was just moving very fast. Gaki so help me if you so much as talk to that girl I will eat her. Kurama grumbled. Shikaku started to berate the fox about a lack of taste in people when someone caught Naruto's eye. That girl in the black and red. Does it look like she is getting bullied by that white girl? Naruto asked the three bijou. Kurama smirked and started to tease him again. Kid you should be more like me. You humans are so pathetic that I don't see color. You're all just the same. That girl is actually entirely white. Naruto chuckled at Kurama's realization. Her hair, her dress, her sheath, and her skin were entirely nothing but white. Upon closer inspection, there was a collar to her jacket that was lined in red. A hundred Ryo says she is an ice princess. Kurama gambled. She does look incredibly haughty from here. These kids don't look like they've been taught proper respect for others. Yuki groused unhappily. He may be the most agreeable of the present bijou, but even after his long partnership with B, he was still rather strict where dignity was concerned. After a few moments more of what looked like a one-sided dressing down of the black and red girl Naruto, decided to get to his feet and jumped down the building. He cautiously made sure to avoid cameras because he wasn't quite sure if jumping from buildings was normal or not yet. Gaki, they've been here less than five minutes. Are you already going to stick your nose where it doesn't belong? Kurama agitatedly chided the spiky blonde that was now in brusque motion towards the pair of girls. Can't just let some young kid get bullied. Hits too close to home, Naruto thought solemnly. Kurama's teasing abetted as he stretched himself while still across Naruto's shoulder. Well let's hurry up then kid. It looks like the princess is waving around some of that dust stuff, and red's about to blow. Naruto looked at the younger looking girl and was confused when he didn't see any type of anger across her face. Things made a lot more sense when he realized the girl looked like she was about to sneeze due to the rainbow of dust floating around her. Reacting faster than his brain could process, he held out his right palm towards the cloud of dust and blinked. All of the dust particles quickly and carefully made their way into his hand, forming a small-sized ball. His action garnered the attention of both the girls as they looked to see where the dust had shot off to. The white girl gave him an impressive frown whereas the red and black girl just eyed him nervously. He waved his free hand at the two girls and made his way over to them. The ball of dust remained equidistant from his now palm-up hand as he walked forward. Hey there. The name's Naruto. Sorry to step in and bother you both, but you were getting dangerously close to exploding. Naruto introduced himself with a cheeky grin on his face. 
Much to his amazement, the white girl's frown got even deeper. Explode? We were in no danger of anything happening until you came along and interfered. I hope you know how to properly handle that dust. The white girl scolded him. Naruto had to blink twice in hopes that the stupidity would go away, and this would be revealed to be some form of joke he didn't get. After a momentary pause where no such luck ensued, he carefully pressed forward. If you look really closely you'll see that there is fire dust in this ball. Red here was about a moment away from sneezing which would have likely ignited the first dust. Once the fire dust ignited the rest of it, was sure to go off afterwards. I know we're new and all, but you should at least have studied some dust properties before attending Databeo. As Naruto mentally punched himself for his ever-present verbiage, the white girl looked ready to assist in a more physical sense. Do you not know who I am? I am Wai Shni, heiress to the Shni Dust Company, and I will have you know I know far more about dust than you do. Wai's voice was so annoying to Naruto he was having trouble focusing on anything. Until this moment he didn't think it was possible to hear a spoiled and privileged upbringing just by the sound of a voice. When he finally managed to work his way past that and examined what she was saying he was hit with a realization. It all makes sense. Naruto said so quietly the two girls had trouble hearing him. All the times he called me that this must have been what he felt like. Sure he was nothing like the girl, but the sheer frustration at someone so obstinate must have been the same. Who called you what? Why see that at the blonde boy? Nothing you need to worry about, Doe. Naruto said with a small smile across his face. What did you just call me? The girl inquired her rage temporarily lessened by her curiosity. Why don't you go look it up? I would hate to ruin the surprise. Naruto teased with a grin. A frustrated Weiss leveled him one last glare, and then stormed off. Unsure of how to properly dispose of his dust ball, he looked around for a trash can. He quickly reconsidered his idea to put explosives in a public place and took out a storage scroll from a satchel on his side, depositing the dust ball into it. Wow, that's so cool. When he looked up the black and red girl had quickly invaded his personal space, and was on her tippy toes looking at his storage scroll. Naruto quickly closed the scroll and deposited it back in his satchel. The girl then looked up to him and spoke again. Your eyes look cool too. Is that part of your semblance? The girl's silver eyes looked into his own. Looking closely at them, he could almost make out the reflection of him's. Shit, Rinnegan. Naruto quickly chastised himself. He blinked his eyes and they turned back to their normal ocean blue. Time to talk my way out of this one. Erm um, yeah, kind of. Whenever I use that ability, you just saw my eyes change. Not really sure why though. Naruto assured her with a blatant lie. Sorry if I interrupted anything. You just looked like you needed a hand with dough. The girl quickly raised her hands and shook them in denial. No, 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 no. I totally needed a hand. Lots of hands. I mum. Not the best at socializing and all. She nervously looked down at her feet as she twiddled one black boot into the ground embarrassedly. After a few seconds, she apprehensively looked back to the blonde boy to see a warm and soothing smile. Don't worry about it. I spent most of my life traveling without talking to people. Even if you're not the best at socializing, I probably won't know enough to notice. He laughed in joking self-deprecation. Unable to deal with the girl's adorable happiness, without blushing slightly he coughed and pressed on. So, like I said my name is Naruto. Oh, my name is Ruby, Ruby Rose. It's nice to meet you Naruto. The girl beamed enthusiastically at him. Naruto chuckled at her energy, and was about to say something when she quickly spit out. Can I see your weapon? She said it so quickly he had to try to figure out what she said, right? The hunters here all tend to fight with a single weapon. Naruto remembered from his information gathering. He found it strange that they weren't versed in multiple tools like in the elemental nations, but learned to roll with it. Yeah, I fight mainly with kanai knives. You can use them like daggers and throw them. They are pretty cool. Naruto grabbed one from his satchel and spun it around before grabbing it and sinking to a combat stance. Ruby practically glowed at him. Oh my gosh, that is so cool. Exotic yet simple and versatile. Do you want to hear about my weapon? Ruby asked with equal parts excitement and trepidation. Naruto laughed and realized that her zealousness towards her weapon must have gotten her into some awkward situations in the past. Hell yeah. Show me what you got, Ruby. Naruto cheered her on. Responding to the enthusiasm the shinobi showed, she reached behind her back and twirled her weapon as it deployed, slamming to the bottom into the ground to show it off in its full glory. Naruto balked as the giant red weapon reminded him of a certain masochistic nutbag. Recovering quickly, he praised the weapon. That is pretty cool. Not many people know how to fight with a scythe. Now that is an exotic weapon. Naruto fixed her with a cheerful grin. Ruby blushed slightly and proceeded with an explanation. My uncle taught me how to use one. It is also a customizable high-impact sniper rifle. She bragged, clearly pleased with herself. So it's also a gun? Naruto supplied questioningly. Yup. She said with a loud pop on the P. The popping noise obviously disturbed Kurama from the nap he must have been taking because he decided to open his mouth in a large yawn. 
Ruby realized that the thing draped across Naruto's shoulders was in fact an animal. She almost swooned at the sight of the beautiful orange fox. Is the fox your pet? Oh, absolutely. Furball here is practical dash. He was cut off by Kurama clawing the side of his face, causing three bloody gashes to appear. Ruby let out a scared eep, and Naruto glowered at his fox companion. The gashes on his face healed within the next few seconds. Looking back to the concerned slash scared Ruby Naruto could only smile bashfully. He really doesn't like to be called a pet. Just think of him as my partner for both our sakes. Kurama snorted, obviously not content with the description. Thankfully, he wasn't offended enough to claw his face again either. Naruto looked around and saw that nearly all of the students had already come and gone. He remembered hearing they were supposed to be attending some sort of entrance speech from what he had gathered before even making his way to Beacon. Come on, Ruby. We're supposed to be heading to some fancy speech for the new students. Naruto grabbed her hand and lightly pulled her in tow towards the large congregation of energy he felt. Kurama observed the look of the girl in tow and saw her blushing furiously. He snickered from his position atop Naruto's shoulder. I take back what I said about this plan. Watching this kid bumble about social relationships with his obliviousness is going to be a blast. Kurama grinned evilly. Naruto stood in a large hall filled to the brim with kids. True to what he expected even in sage mode, he felt no one powerful enough he would deem a threat. The only exception to that rule was the gray-haired man in a green suit who was beginning to approach the standing microphone. Whereas everyone else's energy so low it was utterly non-threatening, that man had none at all. Regardless how intensely Naruto or the Bijou focused their efforts on him, he remained a puzzle box that refused to open. Noticing that Weiss was gesturing at him while talking to Ruby and the blonde that Kurama had mentioned, he began to move towards them. Before he could even start the motion of a step though Ashpin had begun speaking. I'll keep this brief. You have traveled here today in search of knowledge, to hone your craft and acquire new skills. And when you have finished, you plan to dedicate your life to the protection of the people. But I look amongst you, and all I see is wasted energy, in need of purpose, direction. You assume knowledge will free you of this. But your time at this school will prove that knowledge can only carry you so far. It is up to you to take the first step. In doing so it is possible that every one of you might find your own heading, Ashpin stated. True to his word his initiation speech was thankfully short. Even through his years Naruto still held a disdain for authority figures droning at him for what seemed like eons. You'll gather in the ballroom tonight. Your initiation will begin in the morning. Be ready. You are dismissed. Glinda spoke into the microphone. Naruto was thinking of a way to either loosen up or prank her into a frenzy when his devious planning was interrupted. Naruto. Ruby called out to him to shake him from his thoughts. He looked over to the small girl and smiled. He approached the group of three girls with Kurama walking lazily by his side, clearly bored with napping. He approached Ruby and casually dropped his hand onto her hair to rustle it about. She scowled at him until she saw his giant smile. After that she couldn't find it in herself to even be upset. Oi, does little Rubes have a boyfriend already? The blonde cooed at the red-cloaked girl. Ruby's face quickly lit up to match said cloak's hue before she turned and started banging her fists against the blonde's arm. Ya Wang. Ruby groaned embarrassedly. She then turned to try to reintroduce Weiss to Naruto to find that the girl has already left and was nowhere to be seen. She turned back to Naruto to see that he had already started talking. If she does it isn't me. We just met outside when the dobe was giving her a hard time. Naruto corrected diplomatically. That was a misconception he had absolutely zero desire to see spread about. Yang raised her eyebrow in question and Ruby quickly added. He means Weiss. Ruby Kluet Yang In. She made an O with her mouth and then proceeded to walk towards Naruto. Name's Yang. Thanks for helping my little sis out. Maybe sometime we'll meet up and I'll have to reward you for it. She teased seductively with her right hand on his chest. She looked into his eyes to see him squirm, blush, panic, or any combination of the three. What she did get was something she didn't expect, though. Naruto gave her a nonplussed grin and simply said, She seemed innocent and she was in trouble. There is nothing you need to thank me for. I just don't like seeing people get bullied. Yang blinked slowly, trying to process the innocuous reaction. She wasn't cocky or anything. She just knew she turned boys' heads. A is A. Gravity pulls things down and she was hot enough to make boys uncomfortable. Seeing a boy her own age, defying the, the basic laws of remnant, put her thought process on halt. For a few seconds, she just stood there looking into his eyes and seeing his smile. Yai. Yeah. A much angrier Ruby yelled as she pounded her fists into her sister's back. The blonde awoke from her thoughts and pulled herself away from Naruto, who regarded the two with a confused expression. What is with these girls? Naruto thought to himself. Yuki wondered if he was really that dense. Shikaku was playing in the mindscape making sandcastles, and Kurama was silently laughing. Yang eyed him quickly before breaking back out into an unabashed grin. You're all right, Whiskers. I can tell the three of us are going to be friends, Yang stated. Yeah. 
Ruby enthusiastically supported. They both looked to Naruto again to see his cheery grin. Instead, all they saw was a look of great pain, an untold suffering beyond his years, and a palpable regret that nearly choked the air. They all descended into an awkward silence that felt like it spanned for minutes despite lasting only seconds. It would have gone on even longer if the fox by his side didn't nip at Naruto's hand, causing him to stir from his thoughts. When Naruto stirred from his memories, he saw the two girls looking at him in sadness. Yang seemed to be concerned about him, but more so he sensed the protectiveness of Ruby radiating from her. When he turned to look at Ruby, he saw an intense fear. He saw a little girl who was afraid to be left alone, and the regret of thinking she had made a mistake. Naruto powered through his own mental torpor and gave them both a sad smile. I'd love to try to be your friends, he said softly. Ruby's mood lightened considerably, but Yang continued to stare him down. A few awkward seconds passed before Ruby zipped up to him. Don't you worry, Naruto. We're totally going to be friends. We'll be the best of friends. You talk to me about my weapon, you help me with Weiss, and you seem super cool and nice. You're not going to regret this, Ruby said with a near-fervent desperation. Kami, I'm an idiot. Naruto thought sadly to himself, looking at the little girl who was trying so hard to make sure he didn't reject her. He took a deep breath and then broke out into a grin and rustled her hair again. Don't you worry about a thing, Ruby. Just some personal stuff choked me up for a second there. You've got nothing to prove to me. Matter of fact, I already think you're pretty awesome. He gave her his trademark grin again which she responded with in turn. Yang exhaled in the background and leveled a smile at Naruto. Thank you, she mouthed to him. Naruto gave her a thumbs up with the hand that wasn't still rustling Ruby's hair, an action she surprisingly wasn't resisting, and then looked down to see Kurama pulling at his pant leg. Oh right, ballroom. Let's get going you two. I don't know if you've met Glinda yet, but I promise you do not want to be on her bad side. Naruto shivered, recalling the verbal lashing he had received at her hands. The girls both laughed at his reaction, and they started to make their way towards the ballroom. Naruto sighed with a little mirth, and tried to correct himself. I can make a different life here. I just have to try. Thank you for watching. If you liked our video, please hit the like button, subscribe for updates, and follow our Twitter, info in description. Credits go to the story's author, with details below. Don't miss out on our other content, click on the suggested video for more stories and adventures. We appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you in our next video.